Good evening. I wonder whether you've ever given much thought to the names of the constellations. Many of them are mythological. Take, for example, Orion, that lovely constellation now visible in the eastern sky after sunset, with its two brilliant stars, the orange-red Betelgeuse in the upper left corner, and the brilliant white Rigel, 60,000 sunflower to the lower right. Incidentally, this is a time exposure taken with a fixed camera, which is why the stars appear drawn out into trails. In mythology, Orion was a famous hunter, and he boasted he could kill any creature on Earth, but he had forgotten the scorpion. And the scorpion crawled out of a hole in the sky, stung him in the heel, and caused his untimely demise. Well, subsequently, Orion was placed in the sky, and the scorpion was put there too, but very tactfully, the two were placed on opposite sides of the sky, so there could be no further unpleasantness, and from Britain, they can't actually be above the horizon at the same time. It's been said, you know, that the sky is a complete picture gallery. Look at this lovely old planisphere, drawn in 1730 by Doppelmayr, and there are many mythological figures here. There is Perseus, the gallant hero who killed the Gorgon, Medusa, a hideous woman with snakes instead of hair. And then we have Hercules, who caused such havoc with his twelve labours. In fact, the constellations we use today are essentially Greek ones, even though we do use the Latin names. And if, if we'd followed different patterns, if, for example, we'd followed the Chinese pattern, then the sky would be entirely different. And if we'd followed the Egyptian pattern, well, the sky would include a cat and a hippopotamus. But do let me stress that the constellations are simply line of sight effects, and they don't mean anything really at all, because the stars are at very different distances from us, and we merely see the stars in any particular constellation in very much the same direction. And to show what we mean, we fixed up an experiment in the studio. And what we've done is to take a camera and put an eye on it, for reasons you'll see in a minute, and we've put a globes into a board to represent the constellation of Orion. And there it is, a Betelgeuse in the upper left, Rigel lower right. And imagine that you, on the observer, are in the position of the camera. Now let's switch to another camera and look from a different position. And this time you will see that the pattern of Orion has completely disappeared, because Betelgeuse is only about half the distance away from us that Rigel is. And seen from another vantage point, the pattern disappears completely. And that does show that the constellation really means nothing, and we can make what patterns we like out of the stars. Uh, astrologers, please note. The last great astronomer of classical times was Ptolemy and he died round about the year A.D. 180. And he left a grand total of 48 constellations, all of which we still use, uh, even though with modifications in some cases. But Ptolemy couldn't cover the entire sky. He lived in Alexandria, which is slightly north of the equator, therefore he couldn't see the stars of the far south, and they had to be divided into constellations later. And some of the later maps were quite fanciful. Look at these by Albrecht Dürer. Those are some of the southern constellations that Ptolemy himself could never see. In 1603, uh, an amateur astronomer, a lawyer by profession, Johann Bayer, uh, he drew up a, a star catalogue, and he introduced the practice of giving stars Greek letters, and that practice is still followed today. But Bayer also introduced new constellations in the far south, in particular the southern birds, such as the peacock, and the toucan, and the phoenix, and they're still in use. Then Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal, drew up a star catalogue at the then new Greenwich Observatory from 1675, and he also drew constellation figures, and some of those were really rather lovely. Look, for example, at Virgo the Virgin, one of these zodiacal constellations, and that, of course, is one of Ptolemy's originals, and there is the, the constellation figure. The brightest star there is Spica, which is so very prominent in the evening sky during a spring and early summer. But not all the new constellations added around this time were accepted, and one which wasn't was Antonus, and here's Doppelmayr's representation of Antonus, the boy there with the arrow, at the foot of Aquila the eagle, which of course is an original constellation. And here is Antonus again in a map by Luxembourg. Well, Antonus certainly wasn't the god. He was in fact the, the boyfriend of the emperor of Rome, Hadrian, and I've never been quite sure why he was put in the sky or who first placed him there, but he hasn't survived, I'm afraid, although he did linger on for a long time. In 1690, uh, a star map was drawn by Hevelius of Danzig, one of the leading astronomers of the time, and he also introduced some new constellations, and one of those was Ansa the Goose, and that was tacked onto the existing Valpecula the Fox, and there we see the goose over to the left of the already existing fox. But nowadays, uh, the goose has disappeared, I suppose the fox must have eaten it, I don't know. 
And then in 1752, the French astronomer Lacaille went down into the southern hemisphere and formed new constellations out of the southern stars. And some of these were small and insignificant, but rather long and barbarous names, and Reticulus Rhomboidalis and Equilius Pictoris and so on. Um, I apologize in advance for my Latin accent, but with I'm no classic scholar, pronunciation enthusiasts, please don't write to me about it. But there was one very large southern constellation, and that was Argo Navis, the ship Argo. And that was really colossal. It's included the second brightest star in the sky, Canopus, which looks a bit fainter than Sirius, but is in fact very much more remote and very much more powerful. Well, Argo was so large it was frankly unwieldy, and eventually it was unceremoniously chopped up into a keel, sails, a poop, and a compass. So Argo Navis, as it originally was in Lacaille's day, no longer exists. Of course, in mythology, it represented the ship which carried Jason and his fellow, his fellow adventurers in their rather unprincipled quest for the Golden Fleece. But quite apart from chopping up Argo, there were other constellations which never caught on at all. Some of those were introduced by Thomas Young. And one was Tarandus, the reindeer, which appropriately is in the far north of the sky. And there it is, you can see it coloured in. And just by the reindeer's tail is the pole star, which lies within one degree of the pole. And surely it's appropriate for the reindeer to be there. And then the French astronomer Le Monnier introduced the solitaire, a rather curious kind of bird. Oh, I like the solitaire, I'm sorry it's no longer there. And then what about the lynx? Now the lynx is still to be found on modern maps. It's quite close to the, uh, to the north pole of the sky, not very far away from the Great Bear. Uh, and it's there, it's got only one fairly bright star, the rest are pretty faint, and the constellation's rather formless. And it was even said, perhaps jokingly, that it's called the lynx because you need eyes like a lynx to see anything there. Well, quite obviously, if you were going to form new constellations, it had to be done either by going to the far south, which hadn't been formed in constellations before, or by stealing stars from already existing groups. And that was done in quite a number of occasions. For example, consider the northern fly, Musca, and that was formed by stars stolen from the famous zodiacal constellation Aries the Ram. And close beside that, you can see this minor triangle. The big triangle, also shown there, is one of Ptolemy's original constellations, and we still accept that, but triangular minor, believe it, uh, that has disappeared from the sky. And then, also, we have two telescopes by William Herschel. Now, Herschel is one of the great astronomers, the discoverer of the planet Uranus in 1781, and uh, in the sky, the Hungarian astronomer Maximilian Hill placed his two telescopes, the big one, which you can see there just by the heavenly twins, Castor and Pollux, and the small one down near the constellation of the bull, and those also have now been deleted. There were also, of course, some suggested constellations that were anything but mythological. And in the late uh, 18th century, we come to Johann Ehlert Bode. Now, Bode was a great astronomer, a great popularizer of science, and also, of course, uh, celebrated for his connection with Bode's law, even though he didn't first formulate it. He was a confirmed uh, constellation adder, and many of his groups were, had surprisingly modern terms. There, for example, is the balloon. Rather nice, I think. And then we have an electrical machine. And we even had a typesetting press. And they were not the only three by a long way. Like I, like Boda, was very fond of forming new constellations. And in the southern hemisphere, he added quite a lot of hardware. A telescope, microscope, compass, air pump, pendulum clock, painter's easel, and so on. Then, apart from hardware, there were people. And Young, who created the reindeer, also found time to introduce a vineyard keeper. And there he is, almost hidden, in fact, by the reindeer. Uh, both, I fear, have now been forgotten. But in the main, honours went to politicians and monarchs. Boda introduced the scepter of Brandenburg, the ruling house of Brandenburg. And also the honours of Frederick. And that commemorates the ruling house of Frederick II of Prussia. The rather more romantic, I think, is Charles' Oak. And this is due to Edmund Halley, the second astronomer royal. And this was put there uh, to commemorate the oak in which King Charles II, he wasn't King Charles then, is supposed to have hidden after he'd been beaten at the Battle of Worcester in 1651 and was flying hot foot from Cromwell's roundheads. And there is the oak. Another benefactor of astronomy uh, was King George III of England and Hanover. And he was one of Herschel's benefactors, for one thing. And at one stage, another of Hedel's editions of the sky was George's loot. And you can see it there, even though it hasn't survived. And what about the Palatinate Lion, introduced by Koenig? Not to be confused with um, two very famous lions already in the sky, the zodiacal constellation Leo and, and the Little Lion, but the Palatinate Lion is no longer there. And then we have the cross swords of the electors of Saxony. That was due to Kirch, another one of these ruling house innovations. And what about the Imperial Orb? 
and this commemorated Leopold, Emperor of Germany. It looks rather more like an apple to me, and whether the gentleman underneath really is Leopold himself, I've never been able to find out. And then we have the Polish bull, Taurus Poniatowski, and this honours Stanislaus II of Poland. And another monarch to be honoured was Louis XIV of France. And here we have the French lily, there it is. And Charles I of England wasn't forgotten, and his heart was immortalised in the sky by an astronomer named Sella. Well, we no longer have the constellation of Charles's heart, but the leading star of the little constellation of the hunting dogs is still known as Cor Caroli, so Charles I is not, has not, hasn't been forgotten. Not all the little constellations were rejected. There are some that are still there, even though, frankly, in many cases, I don't think they really merit separate existence. One of these is Scutum, Scutum Sobieski, the shield, uh, honouring John Sobieski III of Poland. And you'll find that just below Aquila, the eagle, one of the famous summer constellations. In fact, Altair, the leading star of Aquila, is a member of the summer triangle, which the other members are Vega in Lyra and Deneb in Cygnus. Well, I think you'll find Scutum quite easily, because although there are no bright stars there, the Milky Way goes right through it. And it really is a very rich area, and it also includes that lovely open cluster, Messier 11, often known as the Wild Duck Cluster, which you can see with the naked eye and is very easily seen with binoculars, one of the loveliest open clusters in the sky. But although Scutum has survived, as I say, Triangulum Minor has not. And that's really rather curious, because very few constellations in the sky bear any resemblance at all uh, to the objects they're meant to represent. The big triangle certainly does, and so does the old little triangle. There are three stars there, which make it quite a well-defined triangle, and I'm really rather surprised that that one has been rejected. Now, going down into the Southern Hemisphere, what about that most famous of all the Southern constellations, the Southern Cross, Crux Australis? You can't see it from here, it never rises above our horizon, but it's just as familiar to Australians and South Africans and New Zealanders as the Great Bear and Orion are to us. And here, in fact, is a photograph of it. You can see over to the left there two bright stars, and there are Alpha and Beta Centauri in the constellation of the Centaur, which is one of Ptolemy's originals. In fact, those stars are not connected, even though they seem to lie side by side in the sky. The left-hand one, Alpha Centauri, is actually the closest of all the bright stars, only four light years away from us, whereas Beta Centauri over to the right is a much more powerful star, very much further away, hundreds of light years. And that, I think, emphasizes the point I made earlier, that stars lying side by side in the sky are not really associated. Now, if you take a line from Alpha Centauri through Beta and pass it through, pass it around, curving it a bit, you will come to a kind of diamond of stars, and that is the Southern Cross. And you may be able to see on this picture that the upper one of the four, Gamma Crucis, is reddish, whereas the others are white. It doesn't look very much like a cross, it's more like a kite, frankly, not nearly so much like a cross as Cygnus on the northern sky is. But in 1679, it was separated away from Centaurus by the astronomer Augustin Royer and turned into the Southern Cross. And incidentally, you may be interested to know, it is actually the smallest constellation in the entire sky, although it's also one of the very richest and includes three very bright stars. Go to the Southern Hemisphere and you can't mistake it. Well, that kind of thing was all very well, but there were other, much more radical suggestions. An astronomer named Hill tried to introduce all kinds of small animals into the sky. And I particularly like Lumbricus the worm. There it is, sprawling around. But uh, there were quite a number of those introduced by Hill, and I think they would have caused quite a lot of confusion, but no one really bothered very much about them, and they've long since been forgotten. But even worse were the innovations of Schiller and Schickard. Wilhelm Schickard of the University of Tübingen had the idea of putting biblical figures in the sky and altering all the figures with rather disastrous results. For example, consider Perseus carrying the golden's head. This became David and Goliath. And Hercules was turned into Samson. There he is. And what about Cetus, the sea monster of the Perseus legend, otherwise known as the whale? And he became Jonah. And Corvus, the crow or raven, another one of Ptolemy's original constellations, uh, became Noah. And the idea there, I suppose, was to de-paganize the skies. Well, even worse, and I think it was worst of the lot, uh, was the plan put forward by Schiller. And what he wanted to do was to take the 12 zodiacal constellations and turn them into the apostles. So on his map of the sky, we had St. Thomas, St. David, Benedict, Philip, Sylvester, John, Michael, and all the rest. And uh, if that had been adopted, I think there would have been total confusion, but mercifully, it never caught on. I have in my possession, a set of slides made from cards produced early in the 18th century known as Urania's Mirror. Sets of them are very rare. Um, I haven't got a full set, I've maybe got slides of them, but I have got one card and I'd like to show it to you. Here it is, and that shows the figure of Orion the Hunter. But the trick here 
is to illuminate the card from a behind. And when you do that, the stars shine out through suitable holes and you get the actual star pattern. It really is rather a clever idea and the pictures themselves are very well drawn indeed. Here, for example, we have Gemini, the twins, the heavenly twins, Castor and Pollux. And what about the Perseus legend, the beautiful princess Andromeda, tied to a rock by the seashore to await the coming of the monster? There she is in the Arrhenius mirror representation. Well, not all the Arrhenius mirror constellations are still there. Look, for example, at Hydra, the water snake. Well, that's very much on our modern maps. In fact, now that Argo has been dismembered, a Hydra is the largest constellation in the sky. And sitting on the water snake's back, you have Crater, the cup, near the middle of the picture. And over to the left of that, Corvus, the crow or raven. Those are all originals. But further over to the left still, we have another bird, rather an attractive one, I think, and that is Noctua, the night owl. And I very much forget the passing of Noctua. And another of the Uranus mirror cards shows the now lost goose very firmly in the fox's mouth. No one seems to know quite who produced those cards, but I think you really, they really are rather lovely pictures. And then in the early 17th century, we had Earhart Weigel, and he drew a globe, and in the maps there, he drew the uh, crests of arms of Europe's ruling houses. And there is a double-headed eagle of the Habsburgs. But frankly, things were getting very much out of hand. And the constellations were all shapes and sizes, from the very large ones, such as Hydra, the water snake, which sprawls across nearly half the sky, down to very insignificant groups, such as Equulius, the foal, which is admittedly one of Ptolemy's originals, but contains no bright stars and no distinctive shape, and I think really shouldn't be there. In fact, in 1870, the great astronomer Sir John Herschel, son of Sir William, commented that the constellations appeared to have been designed to cause as much confusion and inconvenience as possible. And finally, in 1932, the controlling body of world astronomy, the International Astronomical Union, lost patience. They revised the entire map of the sky. They altered the constellation boundaries. They retained Ptolemy's original 48. They allowed 40 others, and they rejected the rest. So many of the lovely constellations seen here are no longer to be found in the sky. And I suppose it really had to happen. I agree that the modern maps are very much uh, less elaborate and less fanciful than the old ones, but they're very much more functional. And even though the situation still isn't by any means satisfactory, and the constellation patterns are still much too complicated, I think they're so firmly rooted now that they're certainly not going to be altered. And they really are here to stay, and after a while, you tend to get used to them. But um, some of those old groups were fascinating, so uh, let me end by showing you two of my favorites. First of all, we have one of Young's inventions, a Volta's battery. And there it is, made up of stars stolen from Pegasus, the flying horse. And there's another constellation, which is no longer to be found, but which hasn't been actually forgotten. And that is Quadrans Muralis, the mural quadrant, or just quadrants, if you like. And that was formed out of stars close to the Great Bear, so it never sets over England. It's long since been rejected from the maps, but every January, around about January the 3rd, we see a shower of shooting stars coming from that position in the sky where Quadrans used to be. And we call them the Quadrantids. So if you're looking at the sky on January the 3rd, even though the moon's going to interfere this year, and you see meteors coming from that direction, well, they are the Quadrantids, and we still remember them as coming from the old constellation, the Quadrans, even though Quadrans itself has passed into history. It's quite an interesting story, isn't it? Well, before I go, just one or two notes. My next program is going to be about one rather interesting star, Beta Pictoris, which may well be attended by a planetary system. Also, I've had a lot of letters about that very brilliant thing seen in the western sky after sunset, and that is, of course, the planet Venus. And you'll see Jupiter and Mars there too, but Venus is outstanding. And finally, since this is the last time I speak to you in 1984, and it will be 1985 before I see you again, let me be at the first, if not the very first, to wish you a very happy Christmas and New Year. Good night.